Throughout her 63-year reign, Queen Victoria survived eight assassination attempts by seven men, with one man attempting twice. The first assassination took place on June 10, 1840, during a parade around Hyde Park in London. The assailant, Edward Oxford, fired a dueling pistol at the Queen, who was five months pregnant at the time. Fortunately, he missed his target from a short distance, and Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were able to complete the parade. The motive behind the attack remained shrouded in mysteries even after intense interrogations. Throughout his life, Oxford had consistently exhibited erratic and violent behaviors with frequent fits of unprovoked maniacal laughter. He was born into an extremely abusive family where his father was a heavy drinker who beat and starved his mother. Oxford's erratic behaviors were severe enough to cause the shutdowns of his mother's food businesses. When he worked at his aunt's pub, he suddenly turned off the lights and assaulted a customer with a screwdriver. In the year of his attempted assassination of the queen, he lost yet another job due to assaulting a co-worker with a knife and beat his mother for no apparent reason. After purchasing two pistols and practicing shooting at a shooting gallery, he decided to make his shot attempt on the anniversary of his father's death. After he was arrested, the police searched his room and found documents about a militant revolutionary group called Young England, which gravely alarmed the entire nation. The documents were corroborated by his own admission that he did not act alone and had co-conspirators. Newspapers began speculating who the man really was and what radical groups were behind his crime. Some suggested that this assassination attempt was connected to a working-class movement called Chartism, which might have been hostile to the crown. Others claimed that Germany was behind the attempt, as Ernest Augustus, king of a German state, would be able to claim the throne upon Victoria's death. Oxford was interrogated by figures of extreme prominence such as the operational head of the royal family, Under Secretary of State for the Home Department, an earl who was a member of the Queen's diplomatic service, and the Privy Council. Eventually, Oxford underwent examinations by doctors specializing in mental illness, which yielded evidence that he was indeed insane. At his trial, his friends and family members testified that insanity ran in his family through his father and grandfather, it turned out that the militant group Young England was entirely made up in his imagination and had no reality behind it whatsoever. Oxford was declared guilty of the crime but insane at the time, which subjected him to indefinite incarceration based on the Criminal Lunatics Act 1800. He remained incarcerated from 1840 to 1864 in Bethlehem Royal Hospital, a mental asylum that inspired many creative works in the horror genre. He was then transferred to Britain's new main criminal asylum, Broadmoor Criminal Lunatic Asylum, where he would eventually be deemed healthy enough to be released. In 1867, he was released on the condition that he could never return to the UK. From 1867 until his death in 1900, he lived an interesting life in Australia, where he started a new life, got married, and became a published writer. The Queen's second assassin, John Francis, was only 19 in 1842 when he became homeless as his business failed. One would think after Edward Oxford's assassination attempt just two years ago, the Queen would have better security, but Francis was able to walk right up to the Queen's carriage on May 29th. He was shooting at the Queen from a distance so close that Prince Albert reported that he could even hear the trigger click. The only saving grace was that the pistol failed to fire and Francis swiftly disappeared into the crowd. The queen, not willing to be confined to her palace until Francis was caught, bravely decided to lure him out by appearing in public the very next day. As she expected, Francis attempted to shoot at her again and was apprehended by the police. He was convicted of high treason and originally sentenced to death. However, his family begged the queen to spare his life in a letter, and she commuted his sentence out of pity. He was exiled to the penal colony of Tasmania, where he would live a fulfilling life married with ten children. John William Bean, the third man who attempted to assassinate the queen, was born with a hunchback and dwarfism. Society was unkind to a man like him, and he continued to suffer rejections and failures until he became mentally disturbed and fascinated by Edward Oxford. He dreamed of getting public attention like Oxford and decided to pursue his moment of fame by shooting at the Queen with a gun loaded with paper and tobacco on July 3, 1842. 
Disturbingly, because he had a hunchback, the manhunt for him ended up arresting the majority of hunchbacks in London before he was eventually apprehended. As he clearly just wanted attention and had no true murderous intention, he was convicted of a misdemeanor. When interrogated, he stated that he wanted to be exiled to Australia, as he was dissatisfied with life in England. However, his charge wasn't serious enough to warrant exile, so he ended up with an 18-month prison sentence. After being released, he eventually committed suicide, with medical authorities declaring that his suicide was caused by temporary insanity. The fourth man who tried to assassinate the Queen, who made his shot on June 19, 1849, was an orphaned and impoverished Irishman named William Hamilton. He was forced to move to London from Ireland in the 1840s due to the Irish potato famine. His anger toward the Queen was partially motivated by Britain's insufficient assistance to Ireland during the famine. However, he had no true murderous intention, as his pistol was loaded with only powder. He told the police that he was tired of living in poverty and wanted to live in prison. He was sent to the prison colony in Gibraltar to perform hard labor and later moved to Australia. The fifth assassin, an ex-British army officer named Robert Pate, was the only one who managed to actually injure the Queen. Pate was well known among Londoners as a lunatic who often roamed the public areas displaying strange behaviors. On June 27, 1850, he was on one of his usual walks around the Cambridge house, where he happened to run into the Queen's entourage. He pushed through the crowd, ran toward the Queen's open-topped carriage, and hit her on the head with his cane. Though the Queen calmly announced to the panicking crowd that she was not hurt at the time, it was later apparent that she sustained a black eye and a prominent bruise. Pate was exiled to Tasmania but eventually married a rich woman and moved back to London. The only assassination attempt with a clear motivation by a mentally sound person was the seventh attempt on February 29, 1872, by Arthur O'Connor, nephew of an Irish revolutionary leader named Fergus O'Connor. Arthur O'Connor's attack was motivated by his desire to threaten the Queen into releasing Irish political prisoners. He also received a relatively light sentence because it was found out that he did not truly want to kill the Queen and his pistol was not even functional. He received 20 strokes with a birch rod, spent one year in prison, and was exiled to Australia. The Queen would survive her final attempted assassination on March 2, 1882 by a Scotsman named Roderick Maclean, who was certified insane two years before. His doctor stated that Maclean suffered from constant headaches and was paranoid about others' ill intention toward him. His certified insane status prompted the Queen to request the law to adjust its treatment of criminally insane cases. This resulted in the passing of the Trial of Lunatics Act 1883, which changed the verdict of the criminally insane from not guilty to guilty but not responsible for the crime. Throughout these assassination attempts, the Queen remained calm and composed in public, but would confess in her personal journals that she was terrified and traumatized. Despite these events causing her a deep-seated fear of crowds, she resolutely continued her public appearances, leaving a celebrated legacy of bravery and resilience.